Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Um, and I believe you can join the Halloween party afterwards downstairs. Um, P1, you're all welcome. Um, drinks and entertainment, David's laying on. Um, anyway, very nice to welcome um, Dr. Can I use that officially? Probably. <laughs> yes. Anna, Anna Gatto, um, who is a recent graduate of the doctoral program at the Centre for Natural Material Innovation in the, in the Department of Architecture at the University of Cambridge, where she was a Cambridge Trust Scholar and an Open Oxford Cambridge uh, Doctoral Training Partnership Scholar. Anna had previously worked as a researcher at the CNMI for three years developing structural bamboo pro uh, products as well as improving improved social housing with natural materials for informal settlements. Anna is a partner at Light Earth Engineers, um, working with Michael Ramage um, at, at Cambridge. And his work was most, no most notably includes the Rwanda Cricket Stadium in Kigali, which I'm sure you've probably seen. Um, anyway, most importantly, Anna has now joined the University of Westminster, thank goodness, uh, to join the <laughs> technical team. Um, so teaching in BA and also in MArch next year. So it's so great to have some new people uh, in here teaching. And so great you're going to tell us a little bit about a lot of the projects you've been working on, which mm -hmm. sounds great. So thanks very much, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. And so today I'm going to talk about, uh, as Will was saying, some of my projects. Um, and. Um, my work has always been related to the social and the environmental aspect of architecture. So I'm going to be talking about that and about how we can design a, a more regenerative uh, buildings for the future. And I want to start uh, by looking at this diagram and um, looking at the definition of regener regenerative design. So it's basically when human and natural systems actively co-evolve as one. We don't know how to do that yet, but we are aiming for that. Uh, for a long time, we've been in the conventional, so the generating and achieving minimum standards. Uh, some have been working on uh, performan performance improvement, and now we are kind of looking at uh, our goal is net zero carbon buildings. But that's just the beginning uh, of all this that you all have to, and we all have to work together to achieve, which is uh, providing, giving back to nature and providing a, a social and environmental architecture in our cities. And I would like to start uh, by looking at the problematic that we are facing as architects and designers. Um, I think we have three crises. The first one, it might be the most obvious one, the climate emergency. Uh, probably you all know that uh, the built environment accounts for 39% of the global carbon emissions. So we really need to rethink the way we are designing and uh, making our buildings. The second one is a big housing crisis. So uh, in 1948, the Declaration of Human Rights was approved. And in its Article 25, it stipulated everyone's right for an adequate standard of living. However, many decades after, we still have 1.6 billion people inadequately housed. And if we just look at a city as London, there's uh, around 250,000 people on the waiting list for a council housing. And lots more are struggling with, um, uh, with paying the rent and uh, paying uh, the bills also. Um, so we have the environmental crisis, the housing crisis, and the third one, which is less ob obvious and became more obvious with the pandemic, uh, it's how uh, our, I call it the health crisis because of the pandemic, but how uh, 
our systems are very rigid and we should look for much more flexibility in the places we build, but also uh, for giving agency to the people that inhabit those spaces. So uh, I say that it became more apparent in the pandemic because we all had to adapt, or many of us, our kitchens to uh, offices or our living rooms to schools. And we realize how rigid our houses are, no? Um, but flexibility is something that we've been needing uh, more flexibility in our spaces uh, for a long time. And we used to have it before, but we, uh, we kind of uh, lost it. So throughout my work, uh, um, I've tried to, um, uh, to look into these uh, different challenges and uh, try to do my best uh, in, the, in the work I've been doing. Uh, so I'll start uh, from the beginning. Uh, as, a, uh, an, as an undergraduate student, I became interested in building with Earth. Uh, and I made this manual for people to be able to build uh, their own houses with Earth. And it was divided into three volumes. The first volume was all about the properties of Earth and tests you can do and how to understand Earth as a material. The second one um, showed different, uh, the main construction techniques with Earth. Uh, again, so people uh, could get the manual and know how to build with it. And the third one was a visual atlas of Earth and architecture around the world to show all the possibilities uh, that building with Earth can bring us. Now, the most interesting and challenging and elegant, I think, earthen building I have been involved in is the Rwanda Cricket Stadium, uh, designed by Lighter Designs, from which I'm a partner. It's a form of three linked parabolic vaults uh, mimicking the bounce of a the, the path of a bouncing ball, um, but also the hilly topography of, uh, of Rwanda. Uh, so it's built uh, with the ancient technique of thin tile vaults, but with two innovations. One by using earthen tiles instead of fired ones, and this was the second building that was done in the world with uh, uh, compressed earth tiles instead of fire ones. The first one was also done by colleagues at Lighter Designs. And the second one was by adding geogrid between layers to absorb uh, the later lateral movement in case of an earthquake. So uh, lots of testing was developed um, to, to understand uh, what was needed to design for that lateral stability. And uh, I was first involved in the project to uh, develop the structural design, uh, and we use graphic statics, which is a traditional method that by understanding how the path of the forces go, you can design very efficient structures. You can see in the, in the previous uh, picture how the vaults uh, are very thin. Uh, so the span, the biggest one is 16 meters, but uh, it's, uh, each of the tiles, it has five layers. It's like the tile by the, plus the mortar is 25 millimeters. Uh, so that's, uh, quite thin in comparison with uh, the span of the vaults. Uh, and it's comparable to uh, an Excel, basically. And then I went to Rwanda to train the local carpenters on how to design the formwork. Uh, this technology, uh, it's very efficient also in the way you build it because you don't need full formwork to, uh, to build the vaults as you would need with concrete structures or normal brick vaults. Uh, basically, uh, the first layer is done with a plaster of Paris or fast setting mortar. So when you put the two tiles together, they almost instantly set. 
Um, so you don't need the, uh, the formwork you, uh, you see there, it's more guide work. So it's to guide uh, the brick layers where to put the tiles rather than, and it doesn't provide any structural uh, uh, stability. So then we trained the local brick layers on how to build vaults. They had never built anything curved before. And then uh, I became the site architect, so I led the construction, uh, which took six months um, and involved 100 uh, local workers, skilled and unskilled. Um, and you can see uh, the, the end product is very manual, no? And this was designed, uh, it was funded by Cricket Builds Hope, and it was designed uh, to promote sports uh, for reconciliation after the, um, the genocide. And this was totally possible because of working with the local community, and it was basically uh, their work, they built it. Um, now, when I was studying how to build with Earth, I kept on asking myself, uh, Earth is a, or telling myself, Earth is a great material, but not really for the tropics. So how do you build in the tropics? And I wanted to find out, so I got a scholarship and went to the uh, Indonesian island of Java uh, to study a two years master program uh, where I focused uh, my work on uh, bamboo and my thesis uh, looked into the evolution of bamboo design uh, from the beginning to some of the most uh, innovative buildings that were happening uh, in the island of Bali. And I looked at different structural frames uh, and different um, different ways uh, of building with bamboo. And while being there, um, a, volca a volcano er erupted in the city I was living, in Yogyakarta, so I got engaged in uh, working on the reconstruction uh, with local NGOs, and I joined uh, this NGO called Humanitarian Bamboo, and we developed uh, the Humanitarian Bamboo Guidelines, uh, basically to train people uh, how to use uh, bamboo. And we talked about everything from how to cultivate bamboo to how to protect it, how to build with it, uh, and general design principles. And we, like with the Earth Manual, a lot of thinking went into how do you teach communities um, how to build something uh, through drawings and basic words. Um, and back in Europe, uh, when I came back, um, I was hired uh, at the Center for Natural Material Innovation at the University of Cambridge um, to develop structural bamboo products. Um, so bamboo is a, it's an amazing material. It's the fastest growing plant in the world. It can grow up to a meter a day, some of the uh, species. Uh, it's, not a, it's not like trees. It's actually an ancient, a prehistoric grass. Uh, so when you cut cones, um, you are not killing the plant. You are actually making it healthier if you don't cut all the cones at once. Um, and uh, you can have cones available uh, so from when you plant the, uh, the bamboo plant till you uh, can start cutting cones, five years, just five years pass, unlike trees that take much longer. And then cones grow in a rainy season and you can cut them every three years. So it's an amazing material to use and it also stores bamboo in it, uh, stores carbon in its cells. Um, the thing is, we don't have it in Europe, so, and it's not uh, very efficient to transport uh, bamboos because they're hollow, so there's a lot of space. 
And so we looked into laminating bamboo and uh, creating, um, creating bamboo beams uh, and spent three years testing them. And the main thing we found out is that the shape of the whole bamboo, so the shape that nature gives bamboo, it's much more efficient than the shape we are creating because we are trying to use it as timber, but it's not timber. So actually we have to go back and figure out a way of making engineered bamboo, but hollow, and because we don't need that amount of material for the strength that's needed. And because we had some extra material, uh, and we like to build things. Uh, we built this bamboo spiral for the International Association of Cell and Spatial Structures. We learned how to fold bamboo through heat. So basically with uh, very high temperature high dryers, uh, hair dryers. Uh, and we made some indentations. So uh, I don't know if you can see, but it's all uh, made of triangles that were basically uh, folded and they were folded by, by hand with some uh, molds. Uh, being there at, uh, at the Center for Natural Material Innovation, uh, I was working part-time on the structural bamboo products and also part-time as the project manager of the Eco House Initiative. Uh, so the EcoHouse initiative was a very nice initiative that brought together uh, academics, students, uh, with NGOs and governments uh, to improve housing in uh, different places. So we worked in uh, the favelas of Brazil, uh, in Ecuador also. Um, uh, we worked in Kenya. And uh, we worked in div many different projects. We collaborated with NGOs to improve their designs. Uh, and this was a project we did for the Philippines. So after Typhoon Haiyan, uh, I went there. I met with uh, NGOs, the shelter cluster, uh, but also with communities to see how they lived, uh, looked into the natural resources available. and. Uh, we were asked to develop a, a design, uh, and this is the structure. Uh, we used bamboo because it was widely available in the area we were working on. And we basically did this, it's like a 3D truss uh, and a reciprocal uh, structure that it's quite resi resistant. And uh, we made an incremental house and so basically we started with a very big structure but we only filled a quarter of it. So families, as they have the means to expand, they can expand but with a safe structure uh, because we did a lot of uh, research into how um, people uh, extend their temporary houses. No? And also uh, we looked into how to make the connections uh, so we didn't want to uh, import any materials, and we looked at what materials are available uh, to tie bamboo uh, in the Philippines. The Philippines, as you can all imagine, uh, it's very big on fishing, so, uh, because there's a lot of islands. So we decided to use a fishing line for the connections. Uh, after... Um, after being at Cambridge, um, I, uh, two major earthquakes hit Nepal, and this was in 2015. And I was hired be first as a, a consultant for a CRS um, to see the feasibility of using bamboo in the reconstruction of houses there, uh, because there was a huge deforestation, and traditionally, uh, for roofs, and uh, they used uh, uh, timber. So I spent uh, a couple of months looking at the state of the art of bamboo in Nepal and uh, uh, worked with communities. Uh, we developed some training and, and started using, uh, because of that, uh, 
bamboo in the reconstruction. I was then uh, hired by Habitat for Humanity as their senior te technical manager. And we basically, uh, there were, uh, I think, one million houses uh, were destroyed. Uh, and there were many, many NGOs working uh, on it, on the project. We did around 10,000 houses. But the main, uh, the main focus for me was to first uh, understand the vernacular architecture, the traditional architecture of the area, understand their, their culture, how do they live, how do they build, uh, work together with the communities, and look at local resources. When a big disaster happens, you don't want to uh, be importing materials. You want to empower local economies, use local resources as much as possible, and uh, create livelihoods that are called, that, so small businesses for people uh, to recover. Um, so uh, we looked at uh, a whole system uh, from, uh, we first started with the research, then uh, we created different uh, livelihoods. So with bamboo, uh, we planted a lot of bamboo because we were going to use a lot of bamboo in the reconstruction. Uh, some of it went into bamboo crafts that were done uh, by single mothers. Other went into uh, a bamboo produ production center that we set uh, to treat bamboo, and after that, uh, into housing. And that's one of the uh, houses we built. We also trained the, um, uh, the local population, so you build capacity. So in the future, uh, when you leave, uh, they don't need uh, any more training. They, are, uh, they have the capacity to develop all this uh, by themselves. So some, uh, the houses varied a lot because Nepal, as you may know, it's uh, like a big, big slope. Uh, so parts of it are quite tropical. So in the south, uh, we build with bamboo and earth. And just uh, like you see here, and we put soil on top. Um, but in, in other places, we use compressed earth bricks where they use, traditionally used adobe or we used a stone in other places where it was available. That led to uh, another project in the Caribbean uh, where I was the construction coordinator for the Netherlands Red Cross after uh, another hurricane hit the island of uh, San Martin. And again, the process was the same. So understanding how do they build uh, locally, uh, talking to communities, uh, seeing what went wrong, and why some houses fell down, why others didn't, no? And looking at uh, what's called the uh, be, be, to build back saver and uh, developing key messages. So developing construction manuals that are very easily, uh, to, uh, very easy to understand, very basic, but that improve the construction. So when other hurricane comes um, and the architecture and the buildings are more prepared. And then we started developing trainings uh, so uh, we trained um, local people that became carpenters uh, and um, together we rebuilt it uh, around 200 houses. This was a small island, so the intensity of the disaster was, I mean, 90% of the houses uh, were damaged, but in, it was a much lower proportion than uh, in Nepal. And all that brought me back to, uh, to Cambridge to uh, do a PhD. And so uh, after uh, these projects and some other projects where I was involved in different countries, um, I felt I wanted to 
look at the big picture and look into uh, housing in urban areas and uh, how, how can we uh, work together to solve the huge uh, housing crisis that we have in places uh, like the UK, no? So going back to those uh, three crises, I started to look into the sustainability and uh, I looked into embodied carbon. Uh, my work has always been closely related to natural materials. And the, uh, the material that made more sense for me to look into was engineered timber. Engineered timber uh, is, uh, some of it is quite new, which is cross-laminated timber, which you'll see uh, in a bit. So uh, it's a very new material. Uh, it has really good structural properties. Uh, it stores carbon, uh, so um, when, when trees are growing, you might know that they, um, they start capturing carbon, but they, there's one moment when they stop. Uh, so if we get that timber uh, from sustainably managed forests and we use it uh, in building houses, we still store that carbon uh, in the houses. Whilst, uh, and I say sustainable managed forests because when you cut timber from those forests, uh, you plant more timber. So you start capturing more carbon. So it's a great uh, way of uh, absorbing carbon uh, from the atmosphere. And we have buildings, uh, for example, uh, here th that have been storing carbon for hundreds of years, no? Um, and uh, you might think, well, do we have enough timber, no? Uh, because if we are to build uh, a lot of houses with timber, uh, do we have it? So just for you to get an idea, um, a, a 100 square meter apartment right now uses around 30 cubic meters of timber. And this is not very efficient, but we, we haven't figured out, uh, or we are working on uh, making it more efficient, but we, uh, we are still not using engineered timber very efficiently. And that accounts for a, a piece of forest of 40 by 40 meters, which feels like a lot, especially because trees grow in 50 years. But if we look, for example, at the, at the sustainably managed forests of Canada, <coughs> they produce 220 million cubic meters of timber per year. That means um, with that timber, we could house 1 billion people in perpetuity. If we were just to use that timber for housing, we are not using it for housing, we are using it for making paper and other things. Um, the, the sustainably managed forests of Europe are growing uh, uh, a lot uh, every year also, so there's a lot of timber um, uh, to be using. Also, it promotes a circular economy, which is uh, part of this regeneration that we were talking at the beginning, no? So from uh, forests, uh, you get the products, um, you, um, you fabricate, you prefabricate uh, your house that you build, and uh, if you do it properly, you design for this assembly that's called. So basically nowadays, uh, so we don't produce so much waste. There's ways of designing to disassemble and timber is a, a great material for that because we are basically screwing it. So it's much easier to unscrew timber and take it down than to break concrete and reuse it, no? Um, so we can take down our buildings when uh, they're not functional anymore, uh, when we want uh, to build something else there, and we can reduce the products again, promoting a circular economy. So uh, we can build uh, sustainably, much more sustainably than we are building if we use materials like engineered timber. These are some of the 
the materials. Uh, this is the Wood Innovation Design Center uh, in British Columbia. And that, that it's up in the ceiling is cross-laminated timber, which I think is quite beautiful. Uh, and then you have uh, glue lamp beams that are, uh, are these beams. And then uh, another similar product is uh, LVL. So basically cross-laminated timber, it's something similar to plywood, but at a much bigger scale. So you have uh, big pieces of timber uh, cross-laminated. Uh, together and you can do walls you can do floors uh, you can do the whole structure with it and I was saying that we are not using it efficiently because that's basically what we are doing because it's how we've been working with concrete in the past so we are replicating how we work with concrete but we are using a lot of timber and uh, it's not just about using natural materials, but also about using materials efficiently, no? So, okay, we can um, build uh, houses more sustainably. Can we build them more affordably, which was the second um, crisis that we were talking about? And the answer is yes, many people are doing it already. Um, this is a project that I really like. It's called La Borda in Barcelona. It was um, built a few years ago by La Col Architects in collaboration with uh, uh, the residents of the space. And something, uh, it's one of the, it was the tallest uh, engineered timber building in Spain at the time. I don't know if it still is. Uh, and one of the things that make this building very interesting, apart from uh, the fact that they design it, the architects design it in collaboration with uh, the residents, is that they have something called the right to use. So basically, uh, you own the, uh, the building collectively but you have the right to use your home. And this means that uh, this avoids any kind of speculation because uh, you move into your house and if in 10 years you want to leave, uh, you are given back what you put, uh, but plus some inflation, but you cannot sell the house at any cost. The, the house belongs to the, uh, to the building. And these are really nice projects to uh, look at different ways of uh, making housing. And their idea is they pay a, a very cheap rent. Uh, they pay like 400 euros in Barcelona, which probably for that you would be paying uh, 1,000. Uh, it's all made with natural materials. It's very energy efficient. And... Uh, it was designed by them also. Um, so they're paying this, this rent and when they finish paying the building, and their idea is that they're going to use that money to improve the neighborhood. So to build schools, to build parks uh, and so on. So for me, this is a, a really nice way of thinking about future cities uh, where there's no speculation and we build uh, sustainably, but also uh, uh, with a very social uh, mindset. No? And the third, um, the third uh, crisis, if you like, that we were talking about was the rigidity of, of uh, the buildings we do. Uh, uh, so I wanted to look into flexibility, how can we make uh, houses more flexible, give agency to uh, the residents so they decide how they want to live. In the past, it's been very much about architects thinking they know how uh, residents want to live, no? But the, the fact is that we don't know because we are just designers. We don't know uh, who is going to live there, we don't know who is going to live there in 10 years, families might change, and so on. 
and I started structuring uh, flexibility amongst hard and soft flex flexibility. So hard flexibility is basically uh, when the flexibility is decided by the designer or the architect. So I have a, I have a living room with a sliding door in the middle that can uh, divide the space into the kitchen and the, uh, and the living room, or I open it and I have an open kitchen with a living room. But that's decided by me, the architect. It's not decided by the user, no? And this has been uh, uh, very much used in the past with moving walls, for example, in uh, modernist, or with prefabricated models. Now, there's another kind of flexibility where the architect doesn't decide on the flexibility of the space. It evolves organically by the residents. Uh, and there's different ways of doing this. Uh, one, uh, it's by spatial repetition. So you do all the rooms of a house with the same size. So any room can have any function. The other one is the extendable unit. Um, where you build a half of a building uh, and residents can extend it in the future. And the third one that for me is the softest of, of all is the open building, which is basically a house without walls, just for toilets and, and kitchen. No? Um, the issue with open buildings is that many times uh, Open buildings are done for people with money to hire designers so they make the interior of, of their spaces. Uh, so I wanted to look at how can we develop something, some walls uh, that are flexible, that are sustainable, and that are very low cost. Uh, so people with no money to hire a designer uh, can uh, design the, the spaces where they live as they want. Uh, and I looked at long-term flexibility, and this is where an apartment can change over the course uh, of a lifetime. So for example, if you have kids, uh, you make more, more bedrooms, but then if they move out, uh, you extend uh, your, your bedroom or your living room, and that's, again, much easier to do if you are using engineered timber because you can disassemble things and uh, reuse them uh, in another way. And certain flexibility, and that's when an apartment can change on a daily basis. So I studied, I developed a grid uh, based on the London plan that could fit all, the, all their building typologies. And I started looking at the flexibility of timber so how can you make timber flexible? And there is this way of making it flexible that it's called kerfing. And it's basically by cutting the timber, uh, you turn rigid panels into flexible ones. No? So I looked at uh, many different patterns um, and different parameters such as thickness, different materials, uh, scales, uh, and as I said, patterns. And as a proof of concept, we developed this pavilion for the London Design Biennale. It's made with six millimeter plywood, and as you see, because of the cuts, uh, you can fold it, and after you can uh, flat pack it, and uh, again, it's designed for disassemble, so it has no glue on it. You can totally take it apart and assemble it in other way, which in other place, which. Uh, we have also, uh, and basically, so uh, the, the envelope is six millimeter ply, and you can see the connectors. We made some timber connectors. You can see them here. So it's form of different panels uh, with uh, different parameters, so the folds uh, work differently. Uh, and the base is quite heavy, so it's made of CLT, uh, to provide stability so it doesn't uh, fall down. Uh, we also uh, made some ribs and to make sure uh, it didn't, uh, it didn't
fall down during the exhibition because it was uh, exhibited for one month and we didn't know how it was going to uh, behave throughout uh, those 30 days. And then I went back to uh, looking at the flexible partitions, how can we develop these very low cost uh, flexible partitions that can be placed anywhere within the apartment and that people can fabricate by themselves, assemble by themselves and so on. Uh, so this was a, a much simpler um, pattern that the, the pavilion and I started with MDF and laser cutters uh, and went uh, after uh, to plywood and this was the first CNC uh, model at a scale and basically it's form of different models it's all uh, it's all uh, fabricated with a CNC machine the idea was to not have any hinges so make something very simple that you can take to a fab lab uh, and someone can fabricate for you or you can fabricate it yourself uh, and very easy to assemble and disassemble. So it's something similar to an IKEA piece of furniture but with walls basically. Uh, and we want to have it open source so people can uh, download it and use it. Uh, so we went back to that long-term flexibility and started looking at uh, the different uh, options within the London plan and how by having flexible partitions that you can place anywhere, um, people can adapt their houses in ways we uh, don't need to imagine uh, or foresee. Um, and uh, we did a, a few full-scale prototypes and this was the final one that combined uh, the whole uh, structure with the uh, CLT walls, the glue lamp beams and the flexible partitions and we placed it at the London Design Biennale in Somerset House this uh, summer and it won the Public Choice Award. Uh, so I guess people enjoyed it. We also asked people if they would like to live in a house like this and 80% uh, said they would, so um, I guess that was uh, a good thing. Um, so basically to wrap up, uh, how can we make cities better for the future? Uh, we need to look at uh, growing our materials instead of extracting them, I think, and looking at cultivation in a long term or thinking about cultivation in a long term. Um, which I think it's uh, something very powerful that we can cultivate our construction materials instead of keeping on extracting them. Designing for disassembly so we don't create any waste. Um, giving agency uh, to people working with communities. Uh, I think this era of housing and architecture, it's about co-creating and collaborative working. Uh, so one person cannot solve it all, but if we all work together, we can uh, achieve great things, I think. Uh, the use of new technologies is super important. Uh, Prefabrication also, you uh, get a high precision uh, and much better quality and at uh, shorter times uh, so you can reduce cost also. Looking at circular economies and providing well-being for both the people uh, and the planet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, would you take some questions? I've, well, I've got a question to start, actually. I just wondered whether, um, what do you think about using bamboo in this country as a construction material? I mean, having used it in other places and looked at engineering it, do you think it is a 
So I think there's a potential of using engineered bamboo. And because also we are importing timber, so on bamboo uh, we can have it ready in three years. So I think there's a potential. I think, uh, well, we were working for three years, but there's still a lot of work to do in terms of uh, standards and building codes. So until uh, we don't test it much more, uh, we won't be able to use it. But I think uh, it's, it might be a good option, and uh, yeah, we might be able to use it. Yes? Yeah, can I just get past it? Just say people can Thank you very much. That was really very, very, very interesting insight into um, regenerative materials. Um, I've got a bit of a question about those um, those kind of collapsible partitions, um, the plywood ones specifically. Mm -hmm. Did you did you test them kind of to destruction? How many times can you kind of collapse and extend them before the kind of the plywood actually starts to break down? So we haven't managed to break them down. I mean, once we I broke a lot of uh, samples. Uh, when testing it, but the pattern we designed, uh, we haven't, w we've opened it and closed it a lot of times. We haven't tested till destruction, but it lasts a long time. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anna, for a, a really fascinating <laughs> talk, some inc incredible projects. And um, I'm gonna ask about some stuff that was kind of in the background uh, mm -hmm. of the projects uh, and it's to do with this kind of incredible mobility that you've had this global mobility uh, into different cultural contexts um, where uh, there was a kind of program of self-development it seems mm -hmm. and self-training but also of course training others communities in terms of materials and livelihoods etc uh, and you were also in that kind of journey interacting with various organizations, mm -hmm. including NGOs. So I was wondering if you could um, reflect and tell us a bit about um, doing that. So in, in effect, uh, something about engaging with NGOs and that kind of global landscape of organizations. How does one navigate through that? How did you navigate through that? in order to create these opportunities? Um, and do you think your uh, training uh, and education equipped you for that? What kind of skills did you deploy in order to navigate that territory? Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK. I don't know uh, if I'll answer your question, but you let me know. Um, so in terms of NGOs, uh, I think it has uh, changed a lot. Um, uh, maybe a decade ago or even less, it was all about us architects coming, knowing what we, what other people, uh, or thinking we know, as I was saying, what other people want and building uh, without uh, working with the community, without looking at local resources and so on. For example, in Nepal, um, I had to fight a lot to use natural materials because they wanted to import concrete, which made no sense for me. Uh, because it's not necessarily a better material or strong, stronger material. I've seen a lot of concrete poorly done, no? Um, so it's, uh, I think, less and less, uh, or, or they're more and more into working with communities because there has been lots of projects that have gone wrong for not doing so, no? Um, and uh, I have many examples, but for example, uh, in the tsunami that happened in Sri Lanka, Thailand, and uh, part of Indonesia, uh, in the island of Sumatra in Indonesia that is uh, Muslim, uh, an NGO, very well-known NGO came and built 100 houses with the toilet facing Mecca. And they didn't talk with the community. No one entered in the houses, and it was a lot of money uh, 
spend for nothing, no? And there's been a lot of projects like that uh, in Yogyakarta, also in another place in Indonesia. Uh, uh, an NGO came that built with earth bags, which can be a sustainable material, uh, went and built their earth bag buildings, but uh, it's a tropical country, you need uh, very thin walls, and lots of transpiration, lots of ventilation. And so it became a tourist attraction, and again, no one went uh, into living there, no? Uh, so I think NGOs are now more into uh, working with communities. There's been a lot about uh, funding bodies also, a lot of issues because uh, you also don't want to build houses, you want to train people so they can build their own houses. Uh, and that for uh, people funding the projects, it's, it's much harder to count than I funded the construction of 100 houses. It's much more impressive that I trained 10,000 people because you don't uh, see any uh, thing physically built, no? Uh, so there's been a transition within that also, but also uh, a lot of struggles with funders uh, convincing them that that's the right approach and that by training 1,000 people you can build 10,000 houses with the same amount of money that you built 100 houses before, no? Um, so I think we are getting better and we are getting more humble uh, because I don't know how people, uh, or I didn't know how people uh, live in Nepal, for example. I know how to um, work on a disaster work to look into how to implement a system of looking into the vernacular architecture, working with communities. But if I come and build something, it's gonna be 100% wrong because I don't know the culture, I don't know how they build, and I don't know uh, the resources available, no? Uh, so uh, I think it's a lot about becoming much more humble as designers and understanding that we are uh, facilitators and that we uh, have a role in the design of spaces, but uh, the users, the residents, are the ones that are going to inhabit uh, those spaces and use those spaces, so we should listen to them, uh, collaborate with them, and work with them. I don't know if I have answered your question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Well, you have another question. <coughs> I, I'm, I would like to know how you, the, the people who you tra trained, how did you um, come by them? Or how did you gather them? Um, so in different ways, normally they, we advertised it. So uh, we paid people to train them. Uh, so we give them a job, basically. So when they're being trained, uh, they, they, they are earning something for a living. Uh, and I think that's very important because it's uh, unemployed people that are struggling, so uh, you need uh, to pay them. Uh, and uh, for example, in the Caribbean, we advertised it and we interviewed, we basically accepted everyone. Um, in Nepal was, much bigger, so it was, uh, we had a big system of working with different communities and uh, people in charge of the communities, so uh, on a weekly basis we would uh, talk to the communities, have assemblies with the communities, so we would inform them, and again it was them coming for us, uh, looking for a job basically. Um, and that's how we uh, uh, we accepted everyone that could do physical jobs, and uh, we trained them. 
Well, thank, thanks so much, Anna, and it was such an in, inspiring talk. And uh, as, some, as Pete Silver said, he's watching online, said a truly inspiring talk. So thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> um, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.